In the past, I've made tutorials on how to raise ants in captivity, from a single queen to a colony thousands of ants strong. But I've only briefly touched upon potential nesting mediums and designs. So throughout this series of videos, I'm going to be covering the subject in a little more detail and walk you through how to build your very own ant nest. In this first episode, we'll be looking at a very cheap and simplistic, yet highly effective solution, which I like to call the tubs and tubes method. A well-designed nest is comprised of two main elements, the foraging area, where the ants collect their food and dump their garbage, and the nesting area, where all the ants reside and store their brood. First, let's focus on the foraging area. Any sort of container will do, transparent ones made of glass or acrylic are best. You can usually find these sorts of containers at pet, aquarium and kitchen supply shops. You'll also need some vinyl tubing. This will act as tunnels for the ants to navigate through. Vinyl tubing can be found at most hardware stores and comes in a range of sizes. Which size you choose will depend a little on the species you intend on housing. Ideally, you want to allow enough space for at least two-way traffic. So for most ants, 10 millimeters will do. For larger ones like sugar ants, you might want up to 16 millimeters. And for something like bull ants, even larger still. Once you've picked an appropriate size, you'll then need to attach it up to your container. So work out where you want it to connect. Anywhere on the sides, towards the bottom is ideal. For mine, I'm putting a couple on one of the sides. Now it's just a matter of cutting out some holes. A drill is ideal, but if you don't have access to one, a sharp and sturdy blade like from a pair of scissors works perfectly. Just apply a little pressure and slowly work your way through, like so. If you're going with a glass tank, you'll likely need a specialized drill bit in order to get through cleanly. Preferably, you want to end up with nice round circles, slightly smaller than the circumference of your tubing. Once you're done, place the end segment of your tubing in some hot water just until it softens up a bit. Then, squeeze it through and you should have a nice fit. Preparing these holes and tubes like this allows you to easily connect the ants up to additional foraging and nesting spaces once they require it. Until such time, simply plug them off with some cotton wool or remove the tubing and seal the hole off instead. A bit of sticky tape works nicely. Now the tubing is done, the tub needs to become escape proof. I found the most effective way to do this is by using this specialized, non-toxic liquid known as Fluon. Just apply a thin layer in a circular motion with a brush or even a bit of cotton wool. Make your way around all the upper inner edges, being careful you don't leave any gaps. It helps if you work with the container upside down, that way you won't end up with unsightly drip marks down the insides. When you're done, just leave it to dry for around 10 minutes or so. Once dry, the surface becomes super slippery. Any ants that try crossing the barrier will have a tough time gripping on and end up falling back down to the bottom. Over time, the barrier will lose its effectiveness. So every three to six months or so, clean off the old layer and reapply a fresh one. Fluon can be found online. Although it may seem a little pricey, you really don't need to apply very much of it for it to be effective, so it'll likely last you a long time. I've had this small 100 milliliter bottle for around three years now, and as you can see, it's only just starting to run out. For added security, it helps having a tight fitting lid, just in case some nifty ants manage to find a way up. However, you still need to allow for some ventilation. This can be achieved by simply cutting some holes into the lid then just applying some fluon around them and or stuffing them with some permeable material like cotton wool. Alternatively, you could cut out a large section or two and then glue on a sheet of meshing. 
Just make sure it's fine enough so the ants won't be able to squeeze through. Now it's time to decorate. A layer of a fine substrate like sand works nicely. I'm going for this deep orangey reddish sand which is found naturally throughout central Australia. Whichever you go for, just make sure it is and will remain bone dry. Otherwise the ants might choose to dig into it and end up moving their colony underground and out of sight. Next, I like to add in something the ants can climb on, essentially giving them additional surface area to explore. I'm going for some small rocks and pieces of wood, but you can go with whatever you fancy, some figurines even. It's really up to you. Just don't get carried away. Remember that the ants will be using this space to dump their garbage, like the exoskeletons of past prey. So the less decorative and more open the area is, the easier it'll be for you to clean and maintain later on. Now you can just leave the container bare if you like, but just note that having some form of substrate can be beneficial for many species, especially those whose larvae spin cocoons, like this colony of jumping jacks here. When the larvae are nice and plump, the ants will carry little bits of substrate back into their nest and start covering them up. This aids the larvae in the construction of their cocoons as it gives them something to grip onto and act like scaffolding for their strands of silk. Finally, we're done with the foraging area and it's ready for ants. Assuming you've been raising your colony in a test tube setup, all you have to do is simply place the tube inside. For most ant species, test tubes comprised with a water reservoir blocked off with some cotton wool serves as a perfectly adequate nesting environment. Either plastic or glass tubes work fine. I prefer glass as they provide a clearer view and are far more scratch resistant than plastic. If you need some guidance on how to effectively set one of these up, I cover the topic in my How to Raise a Queen Ant tutorial here. To prevent the tube from rolling around, press it down a bit and slightly bury it in the substrate. If you do choose to go with a bare container, use something like blue tack to secure it down instead. You also have the option of connecting the tubes externally by utilizing the holes you've cut. Simply link up the test tube with the vinyl tubing. Secure it on with some sticky tape if needed. Finally, you want to cover the nest from light. A strip of tin foil works well. Or if you want a more natural look, a leaf or a piece of bark will suffice. For the external style, pipe insulation works perfectly. And like its name suggests, it'll help in keeping the colony at a nice consistent temperature too. Whatever you end up using, just make sure it's not too much of a hassle to remove. That way you can check up on the ants with minimal disturbance. Once you're happy with their placement, simply remove the cotton seal. Now the colony is free to roam around and explore their new environment. Place in some food and they'll be sure to find it. This kind of setup is perfect for claustral queens who've just recently acquired their first generation of workers. And also for semi-claustral queens, queens in which must consume food whilst undergoing their founding stage, like this giant bull ant queen here. As the colony grows, they'll require additional nesting space which can be achieved by simply introducing further test tube setups, same as before. Or what I like to do is set up a small container, something which hasn't much depth to it and comes with a nice clear and tightly fitting lid. This phone case here works perfectly. Just drill a hole in to match the size of your tubing, fill it with a few test tube setups and attach it up. Before long, the ants will discover the new space and begin moving on in.
eventually the water in each of these tubes will run out and the ants will need some fresh ones to inhabit. So when the water does start running low, just move the ants out by exposing them to light. Perhaps direct them to a new module of tubes. Just keep it nice and dark and they should move straight in. Once they've moved, simply detach and block off the old nesting area. The great thing about using test tubes is that they're infinitely reusable, so don't throw out these old ones. Just remove the cotton with a frayed stick. Give them a quick clean with some hot soapy water, and they're good to go again. So the tubs and tubes method, it really is a foolproof, inexpensive, and highly effective way of raising ants. However, it does come with its downsides. The cylindrical shape of the test tubes makes everything inside seem a little distorted and so doesn't allow for the greatest viewing experience. And more importantly, some ant species just aren't well suited for test tubes. Some ants find it difficult to grip onto glass and plastic surfaces, so trying to raise them in one could really debilitate the colony. And others may prefer a relatively dry nesting environment and so won't adapt very well to the high humidity levels in which a test tube setup provides. If there's one thing I've learned about raising ants, it's that there is no one size fits all. Each species has specific needs and it takes some intuition and experimenting to fulfill them. For this reason, throughout this series I'll be covering how to build a variety of nesting styles, including Hebel, acrylic, soil, and more. In the next episode, we'll be working with Hebel, also known as Waitong or AAC. And we'll also be featuring our range of premium models, soon to be available on our official shop at ansaustralia.com. Here's just a little sneak peek of what we've been working on. We'll also be offering essential ant keeping items, many of which have been utilized throughout this video, such as test tubes and vinyl tubing. More info on our shop coming very soon, here on YouTube and over on our Instagram and Facebook page, so stay tuned. As always, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed.